And you, we, we've had the walk and we've had the talk and I'm going to waddle in between the two <laughs> for the next 20 minutes, but bear with me and I'll, I'll try and make it interesting for you. Um, you. You've taken up most of my initial slides so I can bounce through these, that's my introduction. Um, just to contextualise, I suppose, um, Jigsaw's a service, we're based here in Galway. Um, we, we do try and promote our service as non-judgmental, which is something we say all the time, but I would spend a lot of time engaging with young people in the community to try and destigmatize the idea of looking for support at difficult times and also destigmatize the idea of attending a service. Um, so we, we could not do that without involving young people because as, as young as I might think I am, um, I, we, we do need to stay connected with the young people in the community. So they've been involved from the very beginning um, of our development. In, in designing a service that is youth friendly and we have a very esteemed member of our youth advisory panel, Roisin, who's here today and I'm sure she's happy to answer questions today about, uh, you are, you always are. Uh, I thought you were going to take this today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're tag teaming. Um, so primarily today we're talking about research, we have a, a subgroup in um, relation to research, um, so I'm going to focus on that. That's just to kind of explain how we explain the service. Um, to young people out in the community and to, I suppose, to, to promote help seeking in relation to any difficulties they might be experiencing in their lives. Um, this is our youth advisory panel. This is some members of our youth advisory panel. Um, and I suppose I just want to talk you through their role first. Um, just to explain that primarily their role is to voice their opinions as young people. One of the things I'm very clear on with the youth advisory panel is that they will absolutely voice their opinions as young people, but they do not represent young people in Galway because I might live in, in Ballyban or I might live in Clifton, but I'm not a representative of the Clifton community in its entirety. So we're very careful to make sure that we don't consider ourselves as accessing all views of all young people in Galway. We're just speaking to some young people to get their insight and, in their, and, and their input. They do promote the service formally and informally in the community. Um, and, and they would act as representatives and speak on behalf of the service as well. And they advise us and, and make joint decisions um, about the service. And that would include things like the design of, of, the, of the service, choosing furniture and interviewing staff. And none of you have been interrogated in an interview as much as you will be by a youth advisory panel. Um, they'll drag you through the calls, and deservedly so, and they make excellent calls. And no staff member is appointed unless they're approved by both the professional panel and the youth advisory panel. Um, as, as Adele mentioned in 2015, then they got involved in two research projects. Now, the research projects that they got involved in were the um, dissertations of two master's students. So I suppose that the, the rationale of me being here today is to just, for those of you who are maybe beginning projects and, and are not on a national scale, is to encourage you to, to take this on. Um, to grab the bull by the horns and absolutely to, to invest your time and energy in, in because the, the value of engaging the public in, in research will start small and, and we, we do need little seedlings around the country to prove its worth. Um, just to kind of explain how we recruit our YAF members because you could also apply this if you're recruiting people to involve in research. Um, we, we often have YAF members who are nominated by staff members, so you might look to other professionals that you work with, whether it's GPs, whether it's um, service providers in primary care, and you might ask them to maybe nominate somebody that is attending the service to speak to them and to ask them to, to, to engage the person if they're interested. We would often get people who self-refer, so we might get an email from somebody who says, hey, I've been looking around online, I want to volunteer my time, can I get involved? Um, and sometimes we source them through other organisations. This needs to come with a health warning though because if you're recruiting through a particular organisation, they might be used to a relationship in that organisation. For example, we'd often get somebody nominated because they're really good at committees. And we're not looking for fantastic public speakers and we're not looking for people who are amazing performers <coughs> at committees. We're looking for somebody who gives a damn, somebody who cares about youth mental health and, and somebody who's willing to work as a team um, but doesn't necessarily have to come equipped with training and performance. So be careful when you're sourcing through other organisations because they can often um, suggest their prized child. 
um, and sometimes the, the quieter members can give the most um, valuable insight. Um, and w what we also did a few years ago is we advertised. We advertised in schools and local papers and on social media, and we asked people to, to, to put their names forward. We did have an application form, and it was very simple. It was literally, why do you want to get involved? What do you think you would bring? What do you want to get out of it? The most important thing for me is that there's an, a, a kind of openly mutual relationship. Because, yes, we're looking for their time on a voluntary basis. We're looking for their energy. We're looking for their honesty. We're looking for their, 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 their essence, and we want to involve that. Um, we're, there's a lot of gain for us in that. So we do need to give something back, whether it's that they enjoy being involved and being heard, which came through very strongly on, on your presentation, and thanks for that. It's very inspiring. But also that you know they get training, um, that they get experience, and that they get exposure to maybe people they wouldn't meet in their daily lives. And that, that can be, that can be um, a bit of a, a return as well. We do do informal interviews. We don't call them that. We call them, let's meet for a chat. It always involves two people. One person, um, in my case, I would have been trained in, in doing assessments um, in relation to risk and also in relation to providing support. Sometimes, during that conversation, you realise that actual, actually your, your aims aren't matching at the moment. And maybe the person um, put their name forward for the youth advisor panel because they wanted support. Um, and they thought that this was a way of engaging with the service. And that can become evident. And then I might refer them into the service other times you can have it because I had, w I had one situation where the person was evidently manic and was taking on the world and was volunteering everything and, and was absolutely going to um, fix the mental health service by, you know, so they were at that stage and, and I obviously needed to link them in with mental health services then. So sometimes their need can become evident during that conversation and their need will always override any of your needs, full stop. That, that'll always be the, the, um, the situation. Most of the time, you get fantastic insight into their motivations. And especially if you're going to use an application form, there's a literacy barrier there potentially for some people. So, and, and some people can kind of say something on paper that um, doesn't, it comes across completely different in person. So it is really important that that face-to-face -face meeting happens and that we get a sense of who they are, but also that we explain our motivations uh, we explain how we want to work with them and we're getting that very informed consent at that stage. We either then select them. Now at the interview stage we do make it very clear that we are talking to loads of different people, that we want to get a group together and that group um, will hopefully be diverse. So we're going to think about things like their age, their gender, where they live, what kind of life they live, what they do, whether they're a mother or father or whether they're going to school or college. And, and we very much say that from the outset so that it's not a personal rejection for someone to put themselves forward because it, it's quite a brave step for somebody if they haven't been involved in this area before to come and talk to two professionals about being involved. So they may be selected because they may be able to contribute uh, an insight that we, we currently don't have exposure to or they may be redirected. Um, so if, if we find that there's um, not necessarily a place on the youth advisor panel. So for example, right, we get lots of approaches from people who are studying psychology or nursing in, in, in college. And I quite often have to go back to them and just very, very candidly say, I, you know, we have um, a lot of people in your demographic at the moment and a lot of people, so we, we need to focus on the younger age group at the moment. So it's very kind of not personalized. But I may redirect them to the Galway Volunteers um, centre or to societies in the university and try and link, find out their interest and, and link them in because obviously they, they have that motivation. Um, or as I mentioned earlier, I may refer to a support service if that becomes obvious during the conversation. Um, we do have an agreement form, so we're asking people to commit and I think that's important as well if you are engaging the public in research. You are going to invest a lot of time in explaining um, academia ter and academic terms in explaining research and perhaps explaining the process of sampling or something like that. So you do need a kind of commitment for a certain, and be very candid about that at the start. So we're, you know, we're gonna do a lot of training, we're gonna have a lot of conversations, we're looking for a, a relationship that'll last about a year at least, okay? Then we have a kind of, we don't call it a probationary period, but after a few months we survey them um, at, the start of their, at the start of their membership and we just basically asked them how we get on. There was an anonymous survey and it was feedback for us on, on how we were running things and whether we were being engaging or not. 
Um, and then we do uh, did one-to-one -one interviews as well where we discussed with people how are you getting on, what difficulties do you have. That feedback was collaborative. We discussed it as a group and made um, uh, kind of improvements um, with how we ran the group. Um, we did tra tra team building. We did ground rules at the start and that was very important. And there was a kind of what-if scenario, which is essentially our policies and procedures. But it was just literally what are the difficult situations you might have. So for example, what if somebody asks you out for a drink after a meeting? And you're not quite comfortable with that. Or what if um, you can't attend the meetings anymore? Or what if you're not comfortable with the way things are being discussed? Or what if you have a greater expectation? So we went through all those and we discussed those. Um, we also discussed the organisation structure and where they sit in that organisation structure. And this is very important as well because we all need to know where we sit and where we stand in relationships. Members of the public are no different. Like, think about how you would like to be treated in that situation. You want to know where you stand. You want to know what relationship you're going to have with other people. You want to genuinely know whether you're going to be involved in decision makings or not. And you want it to be very clear if you're not, because expectations, when they're not met, can be very hurtful um, and damaging. So we need to protect people if we're going to engage them. Um, we also did it focused on committee skills um, and we did focus on public speaking and public relations for those who want to engage in that. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but um, it's there if people want it. And then we did emotional objectivity and self-care because you are engaging with, you know, people are there because they care. If they're there because they care, then they are going to get roiled up at, at different times. They're going to invest in it and they might they might find it sometimes difficult to kind of step back and have a little bit of objectivity in an area that really matters to them. So we did, and this actually came from the Youth Advisor Panel, they requested a session on this. Um, so one of my colleagues did a, a spectrum of participation which you were discussing earlier, um, and, and this is very much about kind of service involvement, but it's also about research involvement. The, the point I want to make here very quickly is we need to be very clear on what our commitment to the member of the public is at each stage. So if we're informing them, when we're, then we're saying to you, we will provide you information. We will make that information clear and consistent, and we will try and make it as accessible as possible. If we're consulting them, say, we want to hear you. We want to hear what, what you're saying. We're going to check in with you. If we're involving you, then we're starting to be influenced by you. Okay? We're going, there's something groaning back here. Anyway. We'll, we'll stay put until we see something go up in flames. Um, we're, if we're going to involve you, then we're starting to be influenced by you. If we're going to collaborate with you, then we're going to make decisions with you, and we're going to involve you in coming up with solutions. And if we're empowering you, then you're taking the lead. And, and we have to ask ourselves, we really, really need to ask ourselves if we have the bravery to do that. Do we have the bravery as academics or as service providers to let the decision making be led at times? by members of the public. And when is the right time to do that? You know, and when do they feel in a position of power to, be, to, do, to do that? So in relation to research, we had um, the privilege in 2015 of working with a highly motivated student. She wanted to do youth-led research. She came to us, she approached us, and she, her supervisor was Pat Dolan, and he's very much leading in relation to youth-led research as well. She provided a lot of training. We created a subgroup out of the Youth Advisory Panel. Unfortunately, none of the members of the subgroup could make it today, um, but uh, they're, they're here in spirit anyway. Um, so she taught them through what is a dissertation? Why would you do a dissertation? What is the focus of it? What is social research? What does it mean? Um, why would we want to involve youth as researchers? Uh, the research question they formulated. So she asked them, what would you like to research? What would you like to look at? And what they want to look at was the impact of peer relationships on help-seeking behaviour. So they formulated a very fancy and long-winded um, title from that. And they also looked at methodologies. Now, there was an ethical dilemma here. The Youth Advisor Panel involves 16 to 25-year-olds. So there was a stage where I kind of had to step in and say, we probably won't be able to have children interviewing um, other young people about their experience of help-seeking and service use and, and their life experiences. So, and, and whether that's right or wrong, I'm sure there's varied opinions here today. But at the time, I felt like that was the right call. And sometimes you do kind of need to make a call. And um, we need to discuss that as a group. And we did discuss it as a group. And they, and they, were, they, they felt that actually they, they preferred to, they did it through a survey, basically, and pushed it through Facebook. 
Um, so yes, yeah, sometimes you do have conversations where you need to safeguard the people who are engaging and, and look at what are the best ways to, ways to, to do that. Um, and we talked a lot about ethics and we talked a lot about confidentiality. Five minutes. Um, okay. We talked a lot, as I tend to do. But anyway, right. Um, we had another um, student as well, and this was part of a fantastic initiative in NUI Galway to engage the community in the knowledge that the university is, is creating. Um, Caroline McGregor is in the Department of Social Work, and they wanted to work with CKI, and, and to, they asked students to self-select to do research in the community with community organisations. And I must, um, and obviously I, I got involved, um, and this package, we'll say, is called EPIC, which is engaging people um, in communities. Uh, we, we, as a service, identified the question. We wanted to look at the health outcomes for young people accessing Jigsaw. So not the clinical outcomes, but the health outcomes of, of young people, the well-being outcomes in particular. Um, this was the, the gem in the crown, basically. This was the student um, who put herself forward and took on that extra piece of work at a significant um, year in her life. So she collaborated with the YAF members. We did introductions, just informal introductions. We, we got ethical approval, and there's also a permission group in Jigsaw, um, which is the research evaluation and training consultation group, which involves re representatives from the university, from the HSE, and from the community sector. And they provide, um, allow pr I suppose they safeguard people um, in relation to research in Galway, um, in Jigsaw Galway. We had a focus group with the youth advisory panel. We said, what is well-being? What does it actually mean to you? What does it look at? What are the kind of things that we should be asking young people who have attended the service? And that helped us to for, uh, helped Rachel to formulate the interview schedule then. The youth advisory panel then created a subgroup. They interacted on Facebook and they met in person and they would have looked at the schedule and looked at the questions and rephrased them and reconsidered them, reduced them and edited them. Um, and we also consulted with them on consent materials. So that's a good example of kind of like when sometimes, because you know, it's not always that you're going to empower them in absolutely every stage. Sometimes you want to consult because with consent you have to say certain things. But you may involve them in relation to rephrasing it and, and, and changing the language and, and the presentation. Um, and we also discussed the results. So Rachel came back and met with with the youth advisor panel, and as did Stephanie actually, and presented the results. Um, and then from that, the youth advisor panel identified what were the significant things for them, and what would they like to communicate out to other young people about the study. And they designed a one-page summary. Um, so this is kind of front and back the summary um, of of the study. And I went through like it named the study. Um, they looked at. This is really interesting, actually, right? So we, we worked on this, sorry, interesting to me. I don't know why I got so excited. But <laughs> we worked on this one page, right? And we, we all thought, we were, you know, it was fantastic. This was great. This was a great summary. Um, it went to different groups, and we checked it with different groups. The user advisor panel signed off on it. And it wasn't until I brought it to a group, the PPI group that Adele is running, that someone says, what, what is Jigsaw? And nobody had ever thought, including myself, to think, to put on what is Jigsaw. And the point I want to make at this stage is you're investing a lot in, in training and equipping um, and developing their skills. There is a tipping point at some stage where they stop becoming members of the public. They stop becoming Joe Soap. Um, and, and they become somebody who is trained to engage in research in a particular way or to engage in a service in a particular way. And that's important to bear in mind because Sometimes um, you can have somebody who believes so much in what you're doing, who's so informed that they no longer become somebody to check in with the person, like, what does this read like to you as a member of Joe Soap? You know what I mean? So you, you need to know when, when to consult um, and outside of the group as well, to consult within the group as well. Does that make sense? Oh, my God. Um, yeah, so they had a lovely summary. It was all fantastic. It's available on our website as well, and they kind of decided what they, how they wanted to present it. Um, just to acknowledge the challenges, it takes a lot of investment. It'll cost you, um, whether it's public transport or food. Um, it'll take more time, and it might slow down processes. And your manager or your um, PI, or whatever that sounds, project investor, whatever, uh, the academic anyway who's leading, will want you to push it on, and you may need to slow things down for it. The location may impact. The time of the meetings may impact as well. 
you can have people who will not meet outside of nine to five and the, the advisor panel cannot meet or your member of the public cannot meet nine to five. So there, there's a bit of a, a crossroads there. You need to have an open, honest relationship and I've discussed that. They care, so be sensitive. There are times when they care and there is problems with our health system. You know, it, no, no country in the world has got it perfectly right and that can be emotive at times. So be sensitive to that. Um, and we do all need to balance patience with progress and research can be slow moving and that can be difficult because they might not see the outcomes of their impact and, and sometimes um, that can be a challenge as well. Um, it's learning for everyone, it's mutual learning, it should be a mutual relationship. Sometimes there can be a lot of confusion, you, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head there, you covered that point with regards to them being, when we were going through ethical approval, um, sometimes they could not, the people who were reviewing the ethics, could not wrap their head around the young people not being participants in the study and not taking part in it. Um, uh, there is a tipping point where they stop becoming Joe Soap from the street um, and watch your language for God's sake. Constantly in, in Jigsaw Go when we get um, consent materials that I struggle and I have two postgraduates, I sometimes struggle to understand the point that they're making. And it's like there there's no excuses for it. Like we have one in four or one in five Irish adults struggle with their reading. And, and then we have young people as well and we have to look at the different backgrounds that people are from. We, we, there are absolutely no excuses for using that, that kind of high power language. There's a time and a place for it and a consent form is not the time and the place for it. And if a 15 year old can understand it, then a professor can understand it. And he'll do just fine in, in understanding. Sorry, you know, it's unsurprising to guess this kind of gets to me. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. I know there's a lot of challenges that I outlined there, but there's, there's no greater privilege you will have than working with the diversity that you will meet in a public group. So absolutely invest your time in it because you'll reap the rewards and hopefully they will too. Thank you.